this idea of multi-hierarchical competence architecture, which is incredible to think about. So this hierarchy that evolution builds, I don't know who's responsible for this. I also see the incompetence of bureaucracies of humans when they get together. So how the hell does evolution build this? Where at every level, only the best get to stick around. They somehow figure out how to do their job without knowing the bigger picture. Yeah. And then there's like the bosses that do the bigger thing somehow, or that you can now abstract away the small group of cells as a as an organ or something. And then that organ does something b bigger in the context of the full body or something like this. How is that built? Is there some intuition you can kind of provide of how that's constructed, that, that hierarchical competence <laughs> architecture? I love that, competence. Just the word competence is, yeah. is pretty cool in this context because everybody's good at their job somehow. Yeah, no, it's really key. And and the other nice thing about competency is that, so so my, my central belief in all of this is that en engineering is the right perspective on all of this stuff because it gets you away from uh, subjective uh, terms, you know, people talk about sentience and this and that. Th th those things are very hard to define. There, people argue about them philosophically. I think that engineering terms like competency, like um, uh, you know, uh, pursuit of goals, right? All, all of these things are uh, are empirically incredibly useful because you know it when you see it, and if it helps you build, right? If I if I can pick the right level, I say. Uh, this thing has, I believe this is X level of like com I th competency. I think it's like a thermostat or I think it's like a, a, a better thermostat or I think it's a, you know, a, 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 a various other kinds of, you know, many, many different kinds of complex systems. If that helps me to control and and predict and build such systems, then then that's all there is to say. There's no more philosophy to argue about. So so I like competency in that way because you can quantify, you could, you have to, in fact, you have to, you have to make a claim competent at what? And then, or if I say, if I tell you it has a goal, the question is, what's the goal and how do you know? And I say, well, because every time I deviated from this particular state, that's what it spends energy to get back to. That's the goal and we can quantify it and we can be objective about it. So, so, so the, the, we, and we're not used to thinking about this. I, I, I give a talk sometimes called why don't robots get cancer, right? And the reason robots don't get cancer is because generally speaking with a few exceptions, our, our architectures have been, you've got a bunch of dumb parts and you hope that if you put them together, the, 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 the overlying machine will have some intelligence and do something or other, right? But the individual parts don't, don't care. They don't have an agenda. Biology isn't like that. Every level has a, an agenda and the final outcome is the result of cooperation and competition both within and across levels. So for example, during embryogenesis, your tissues and organs are competing with each other. And it's actually a really important part of development. There's a reason they compete with each other. They're not all just, uh, you know, sort of uh, helping each other. They're also competing for, for information, for metabolic, for limited metabolic um, constraints. But to get back to your 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 other point, which is you know which is which is this seems like really efficient and and good and 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 so on compared to some of our human efforts, we also have to keep in mind that what happens here is that each level bends the option space for the level beneath, so that your parts basically they don't see the 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 geometry. So so, so I'm I'm using um. And I and I and I think uh, I, I take this this seriously. Uh, terminology from from like um, from like relativity, right? Where where the space is literally bent. So the option space is deformed by the higher levels, so that the lower levels, all they really have to do is go down their concentration gradient. They don't have to. In fact, they don't. They can't know what the big picture is. But if you bend the space just right, if they do what locally seems right, they end up doing your bidding. They end up doing things that are optimal in the in the higher space. Conversely. Because the components are good at getting their job done, you as the higher level don't need to, uh, to try to compute all the low-level controls. All you're doing is bending the space. You don't know or care how they're going to do it. I'll give you a super simple example. In the, um, in the tadpole, we found that, okay, so, so tadpoles need to become frogs. And to, become a, for, to go from a tadpole head to a frog head, you have to rearrange the face. So the eyes have to move forward, the jaws have to come out, the nostrils move, like everything moves. It used to be thought that because all tadpoles look the same and all frogs look the same, if you just remember, if every piece just moves in the right direction, the right amount, then you get your you get your frog, right? So we decided to, to test. We I, I had this hypothesis that I thought I thought actually the system is probably more intelligent than that. So what did we do? We made uh, what we call Picasso tadpoles. So these are so everything is scrambled. So the eyes are on the back of the head, their jaws are off to the side. Everything is scrambled. Well, guess what they make? They make pretty normal frogs because all the different things move around 
in novel paths configurations until they get to the correct uh, froggy, uh, you know, sort of frog face mm -hmm. configuration, then they stop. So, so the thing about that is now imagine evolution, right? So, so you make some sort of mutation and it does like every mutation, it does many things. So, so, so something good comes of it, but also it moves your mouth off to the side, right? Now, if, if, if there wasn't this multi-scale competency, you can see where this is going. If there wasn't this multi-scale competency, the organism would be dead. Your fitness is zero because you can't eat. And you would never get to explore the other beneficial consequences of that mutation. You'd have to wait until you find some other way of doing it without moving the mouth. That's really hard. So, so the fitness landscape would be incredibly rugged. Evolution would take forever. The reason it works, well, one of the reasons it works so well is because you do that no worries, the mouth will find its way where it, where it belongs, right? So now you get to explore. So, so what that means is that all of these mutations that otherwise would be deleterious are now neutral because the competency of the parts make up for all kinds of things. So all the noise of development, all the, the, the uh, variability in the environment, all these things, the competency of the parts makes up for it. So the, so, so that's, all, that's all fantastic, right? That's all, that's all great. The only other thing to remember when we compare this to human efforts is this. Every component has its own goals in various spaces, usually with very little regard for the welfare of the other levels. So, so as a simple example, you know, um, you as a as a complex system, um, you will go out and you will do you know jujitsu or whatever. You'll have some go you to go rock climbing and scrape a bunch of cells off your hands, and then you're happy as a system, right? You come back and you've you've accomplished some goals and you're really happy. Those cells are dead. They're gone, right? Yeah. Did you think about those cells? Not really, right? You had some you had some bruising. Al selfish fine, sob. Right? That's it. And so, and so that's the thing to remember is that, um, you know, and we know this from, from history is that, is that just being a collective isn't enough because, uh, what the goals of that collective will be relative to the welfare of the individual parts is a yeah. massively open the question. ends justify the means. I'm there telling you, you, Stalin was onto something. No, so that's uh, the danger. But we can, exactly. That's the danger of, uh, uh, for us humans, we have to construct ethical systems under which we don't take seriously the full mechanism of biology and apply it to the way the world functions, which is which is an interesting line we've drawn. The world that built us is the one we reject in some sense yeah. when we construct human societies. The idea that this country was founded on that all men are created equal, that's such a fascinating idea. It's like uh, you're fighting against nature and yeah. saying, well, there's something bigger here than um, yeah. a hierarchical competency architecture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but uh, there's so many interesting things you said. So from an algorithmic perspective, the act of bending the option space, that's really, that's really profound. Because if you look uh, at the way AI systems are built today, there's a big system, like I said, with robots, and has a goal, and he gets better and better at optimizing that goal, at accomplishing that goal. But if biology built a hierarchical system where everything is doing computation, and everything is accomplishing the goal, not only that, it's kind of dumb. You know, <laughs> with the uh, with the limited with the bent option space, it's just doing the thing that's the easiest thing for yeah. it in some sense. Yeah. And somehow that allows you to have um, turtles on top of turtles, literally dumb systems on top of dumb systems that as a whole create something incredibly smart. Yeah, I mean, every system is has some degree of intelligence in its own problem domain. So, so cells will have problems they're trying to solve in physiological space and transcriptional space. And then I could give you some, some cool examples of that. But the collective is trying to solve problems in anatomical space, right? And forming a, you know, a creature and growing your blood vessels and so on. And then the collect the 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 whole body is solving yet other problems. They may be in social space and linguistic space and three dimensional space, and and who knows, you know, the group might be solving problems in in um, you know I don't know some sort of financial space or something. So one of the major differences with with most um, uh, with most uh, AIs today is is a the the kind of flatness of the architecture, but also of the fact that they are constructed. From outside, their their borders and their you know so so if you for, so to a large extent and of course there are um, counterexamples now but but to a large extent our technology has been such that you create a machine or a robot it knows 
what its sensors are. It knows what its effectors are. It knows the boundary between it and the outside world. All of this is given from the outside. Biology constructs this from scratch. Now, the best example of this that that uh, originally uh, in in robotics was actually Josh Bongard's work in 2006, where he made these these robots that did not know their shape to start with. So, like a baby, they sort of floundered around. They made some hypotheses. Well, I did this, and I moved in this way. Well, maybe I'm a whatever. Maybe I have wheels, or maybe I have six legs, or whatever. Right? And they would make a model, and eventually they would crawl around. So that's I mean that's really good. That's part of the autopoiesis. But we can go a step further, and some people are doing this, and, and we're sort of working on some of this too. Is this idea that let's even go back further? You don't even know what sensors you have. You don't know where you end and the outside world begins. All you have is, is uh, certain things like active inference, meaning you're trying to minimize surprise, right? You have some metabolic constraints. You don't have all the energy you need. You don't have all the time in the world to, to, to think about everything you want to think about. So that means that you can't afford to be a micro um, reductionist. You know, all this data coming in, you have to coarse grain it and say, I'm going to take all this stuff and I'm going to call that a cat. I'm going to take all this. I'm going to call that the edge of the table. I don't want to fall off of. And I don't want to know anything about the microstates. What I want to know is what is the optimal way to cut up my world? And by the way, this thing over here, that's me. And the reason that's me is because I have more control over this than I have over any of this other stuff. And so now you can begin to, right? So that's self-construction, that, that, that figuring out making models of the outside world and then turning that inwards and starting to make a model of yourself, right? Which immediately starts to get into issues of, of agency and control because in order to, if, if you are under metabolic constraints, meaning you don't have the energy, right? That all the energy in the world, you have to be efficient. That immediately forces you to start telling stories about coarse grained agents that do things, right? You don't have the energy to like Laplace's demon, you know, calculate every, every possible uh, state that's going to happen. You have to, you have to coarse grain and you have to say, that is the kind of uh, creature that does things, either things that I avoid or things that I will go towards. That's a mate or food or whatever, whatever it's going to be. And so right at the base of uh, simple, very simple organisms starting to make models of agents doing things, that is the origin of uh, models of, of, of free will, basically, right? Because you see the world around you as having agency, and then you turn that on yourself and you say, wait, I have agency too. I can, I do things, right? And and then you make decisions about what you're going to do. So all of this, one, one model is to view all of those kinds of things as being driven by that early need to determine what you are and to do so and to then take actions in the most energetically efficient space possible. Right? So free will emerges when you try to simplify, tell a nice narrative about your environment. I think that's very plausible. Yeah. yeah. 